sponsored by Brilliant. Okay, so I've been using Google's Pixel 4 phone for almost a month now. I mean, really using it with my SIM card in it and everything, taking photos, making calls, playing Pokemon Go. Yeah, still. And you know, this isn't my first Google phone. I had the Nexus 1, the Nexus 4, and the Pixels 1 and 2. I usually get the XL, but since I've switched back to the smaller iPhone, I decided to go with a smaller Pixel this time as well. Now, upfront, I consider Google to be the most important company in the world. I love Apple products and their overall philosophy currently best aligns with mine. I think Amazon is transformative in the best and worst ways imaginable. Facebook is a disaster that still manages to bring the world together like nothing else. But Google literally is trying to build the Star Trek computer, the future of humanity. And there is no amount of scrutiny that's enough, no slack cut that's not detrimental to what that future will be for all of us, ethically and technologically. Apple makes phones. Phones that are increasingly tied to entertainment services, sure. But Google's phones are services. The atoms themselves are spectacularly unimpressive without the algorithms that bring them to life and harvest unprecedented amounts of personal private data while doing it, all in service of financing and building that Star Trek computer. So if I seem to be tough on Google and their products like the Pixel, it's because I have to be. We all have to be. I'm Rene Ritchie and this is my Pixel 4 review one month later. First up, I really like Google's new industrial design language with the Pixel 4, a lot. Google made a few missteps with the OG Pixel. They pushed it hard as the first phone really designed by Google, even when it was clearly HTC. And it's not that I don't like HTC design, I love it. It's just that neither of those things afforded the Pixel much of any of its own identity. Worse, when it came to hardware design, Google seemed all loose opinions strongly held. Every year they'd tell us what they didn't need, camera bumps, optical image stabilization, two cameras, only to spin on a dime and add exactly those things on the very next iteration. Last year, we got a forehead on the smaller phone and the mother of all notches on the bigger one, also chins, because Google just had to have a front facing speaker on the bottom. This year, no more notch and the speaker has moved. One selfie camera, two selfie cameras, back to one selfie camera. It would be whimsical if it didn't just all seem so utterly based on whim. There's no way to know for sure if this year really will be any different. Not until we see what Google does with the Pixel next year. I'm a huge optimist, but even I am only cautiously pessimistic about the Pixel finally settling into something like its own identity. Still, if Google can settle into the Pixel 4, at least for a while, I'll be happy enough. I got the orange version, because orange. Like with the iPhone 11, I wish colors weren't so pastel this year, but I don't get to be the fashion decider. I like the new camera bump as well. The black color makes it stand out more, but the lens is less. So compared to the iPhone 11, it's a bit of a wash for me. I'm perfectly happy with camera functionality winning out over flat back form on both though. It is weird that the black one is glossy, but the white and orange ones are not. Like Marquez says, matte black all the things. But the matte is a huge improvement over last year's, which seemed a little silly putty-esque in how it would react to finger pressure. This year, no problems, no marks, no prints. I don't even mind that giant forehead bezel. Yes, it's visually unbalanced with the chin. Yes, it undoes all the benefits higher screen to surface ratio phones have given smaller devices over the last couple of years. But until we can put all the sensors under all the displays, I'm just not gonna nitpick foreheads or notches or holes because they're all still better than mechanical choochers what pop up and down and spin cameras around. And overall, it just feels to me more like a singular object than any Pixel phone has before it. The cameras are still, of course, top notch. Cameras plural on the back this year. They're very different than what the likes of Samsung and Huawei are doing with big glass and kind of goofy algorithms. And what Apple is doing with really good glass and really good algorithms. Google is sticking to okay glass combined with what are still the best damn algorithms in the world and using them to produce what are properly considered some of the best photos from any phone ever. I still really hope they improve the physical cameras as well, but they are at least improving the silicon. The new live preview for HDR plus and the ability to tune both high and low exposure is a really cool example of something computational photography makes possible that traditional photography simply cannot. I just wish they had the performance to do the same thing in every other computational mode, including portrait mode. 
having an arguably the best segmentation masking in the business and now actual depth data for the second camera doesn't make the frustration of having to take photos over and over again and wait for them to resolve just to make sure the algo isn't wrecking ears or glasses. Because of the hardware limits, the way Google handles computational photography is also still a double-edged sword. The Pixel 4 doesn't seem to offer instant shutter the way the iPhone XS and 11 do. So, when shooting side by side, any processor intensive modes would produce delayed images. For example, the iPhone 11 would latch onto the shot immediately, the Pixel 4 a few instants later, often while he was already moving away. Even more fascinating, my friend's brother walked up and stood next to her in the middle of a night shot. The iPhone 11 again grabbed the shot immediately and resolved just her. The Pixel 4 a second or more later grabbing both of them. Pixel 4 photos are also always Pixel 4 photos. Cool, crisp, calculated. No matter what the conditions, Google can and will almost always give you what looks like a great Pixel 4 photo. But it does so by normalizing all photos to look like that, like a Pixel 4 photo. The iPhone, by contrast, works more like a traditional camera. Sometimes it produces better results, sometimes worse, but it's solving for the conditions at the time, not the end result. I think that's why some people love the Pixel camera so much. It's almost absolutely reliably rock solidly consistent, but I think it's also the reason you still see so many professional photographers still using iPhones. Beyond just the huge range of phenomenal camera apps available on iOS, for good or for ill, the Pixel still feels more like science than art. Not having an ultra wide angle lens isn't the end of the world for me. I lived without one on the iPhone until this year after all. That said, I really like having one now and pretty much every other flagship phone has one. So to me, this is just another example of, for all the ways Google is ahead computationally, they're still behind photographically. It's the we don't need, oh crap, it turns out we really do mentality that keeps my caution so pessimistic. Super zoom though is utterly amazing. The quality of images the Pixel is able to put out at 5X makes it legit hard to believe they're not optical. Again, better optics would lead to even better computational, but for right now, it's just something I really wanna see Apple even begin to catch up to. Google has also seemingly fixed last year's problem where the camera app would sometimes take forever to launch and then promptly fail to save shots and frames which, yeah, made the world's most consistent camera phone not even work consistently as a camera phone. As far as I can tell, I've dropped precisely zero shots or frames on the Pixel 4. Hurrah. I also really like how Face Unlock can blast you straight through the lock screen and into the phone without so much as a Face ID style swipe up. I did find a negative with Face ID if the phone unlocks unintentionally, like while you're putting it down or into your pocket, the lack of a swipe just means it'll lock and sleep again in a few moments. Because Face Unlock doesn't require that swipe, if the phone unlocks unintentionally and you don't notice and it opens up on an app that keeps the phone awake, like Pokemon Go, it can drain the tiny, tiny battery on the Pixel 4 real quick. So like I said in my head-to-head -head video, different people and workflows will favor different options. That's why it's having the option that's so important and I hope Apple adds it ASAP. And yeah, not having the option to require attention for unlock is still absolutely inexcusable, especially from a defense in depth point of view. So I hope Google adds that or adds that back ASAP as well. Much like if you need the suit to be Spider-Man, you don't deserve the suit. If you can't be fast without disabling defense in depth, you just don't deserve to be fast. Also, just to get it out of the way, Motion Sense is like 3D touch to me, but if Apple had released it two years earlier with a tenth of the ubiquity and utility throughout the system, maybe putting it in early will help improve it faster. At best though, I don't think the current version is something most people will use most of the time, even if they could. Hopefully Google has much better and brighter plans for it in the future. Speaking of which, the 90 Hertz display is glorious. Everything just looks so incredible, extra ultra smooth. It can have a bit of a soap opera motion smoothing look if you're not used to the high frame rate, but on the Pixel 4, it can also leave you in a heartbeat and dump you back down to 60 Hertz the moment the app or even the brightness level changes on device or ambient. 
You can go into developer mode and force 90 hertz to remain on if you really wanted to, but that it's not forced to remain on by default is a hint and a half that it's really just not ready for prime time yet. That Google has to so aggressively manage it, whether it's for battery life or pulse width modulation reasons, which they seem to be leaning on heavily with this display, the end result is islands of 90 hertz delight amid a sea of 60 hertz normalcy. It's such a huge contrast, I think it would have been better for Google not to do it at all yet if they couldn't do it consistently and just focused on making an amazing 60 hertz experience instead. You know, one that wasn't so far behind Apple and Samsung in sustained brightness levels. On the other hand, the Pixel's voice recorder with transcription is pure machine learned magic. There's no other way to describe it. Google's doing a lot more neural processing on device now. It's something else I'd love to have on iOS as soon as possible. Call and data quality is great. I get roughly the same Rogers LTE upload and download speeds on the Pixel 4 that I get on the iPhone 11. Neither, of course, supports 5G yet because 5G isn't a thing yet. I haven't read as many breathless complaints about the lack of 5G on the Pixel as I have on the iPhone 11, but in either case, the overwhelming majority of people can't use 5G yet, and anyone who really wants to use it next year or the year after will really want to use it with next year's modem technology or the year after that. As much as I can go back and forth about the merits of everything else, weigh pros and cons, argue the subjective and the objective, there's just no getting around the battery on the Pixel 4. I mentioned Pokemon Go in the beginning, and as anyone who's followed my iPhone reviews know, that's what I use to stress test batteries. Constant GPS, screen brightness, data, interaction, it basically fires everything all the time. So when I get a new phone, I take it out for a Pokemon Go event and see how it does. And <laughs> the Pixel 4 couldn't even finish an event. It was tapped out just before the four hour mark. The iPhone 11, by contrast, made it just past five and a half hours, as did the 11 Pro. Travel tests where the battery gets hit by poor airport reception, roaming, and a much heavier than typical workload, likewise killed the Pixel 4 by lunch. Like I was saying in my iPhone reviews a few years ago, people don't just surf the web and check emails anymore. Media heavy social networks, location based and logistical services, games and other entertainment, it all hits phones like a freight train. You can talk about AI based battery optimization all you want. The iPhone has had it for years at the silicon level, but you can't optimize for the constant use workflows many of us are constantly using these days. You just can't. You can only engineer for it when you're designing the phone to begin with. And despite having and knowing all the usage data for all the Pixel phones, probably all Google Play Android phones, Google simply didn't do that. I'm sure there was a lot of in the moment decisions that led to it, from a desire to keep weight down to the need to fit things like the Soli motion sense system in to that sometimes 90 hertz display to whatever was the reason they capped max storage at 128 gigabytes. All design is compromise and trade off and far be it for me to YouTube quarterback any team actually putting out actual phones. But this just seems like a disparate, geeky technology driven decision making tree rather than a holistic end product customer driven one all the way down. I mean, even if you think Google makes a Pixel phone as a showcase for their services or as a massive data harvesting machine, the simple lack of battery life makes it bad at both of those things. And I'll get back to that in just a minute. I also want to touch on Pixel 4 video recording. Like I said in my previous video, that YouTube can play 4K 60 frames per second, but the Pixel can't shoot it. And the Pixel can shoot 4K and HEVC H.265, but YouTube refuses to play it is perplexing. But Google not enabling 4K 60 on the Pixel because its current silicon can't handle Google's imaging algorithms, things like stabilization and extended dynamic range, and their being unwilling to compromise on that just points to how glaring their compromises on things like the 90 hertz display, face unlock security, and battery life really, really are. And again, how disjointed the Pixel 4 is as an overall product. Google used to be ruled by product managers the way Apple is by designers, which is why it felt like stuff was released and killed almost willy nilly, because it was. Then direction started coming down from on high, and that direction was make us an iPhone. Maybe that was to see if Google could grab some of those tasty, tasty hardware profits from Apple. More likely, it was simply to try and get Google employees off iPhones and onto Android phones so they dog food their own operating system. 
Same reason they started making high-end Pixel books for employees used to using MacBook Pros, and even tried Pixel tablets to lure employees off of iPads. To avoid pissing off partners and because Google is just gonna Google, the hardware team didn't really communicate or integrate with the Android team the way Apple's hardware and software engineering teams would, at least at first, which led to a bunch of wonk. Still, the Pixel managed to really nail the overall software experience. They let Android be Android, even with a fresh coat of Google Paint. But the hardware, they never really took the time or went to the expense of nailing that hardware. We got some bad screens and some stingy RAM, sure, but we mostly just got commodity parts made exceptional by algorithms, instead of an exceptional phone that was more than even the sum of those exceptional parts, force multiplied by its algorithms. And then, Finally, now, it's clear that even at flagship prices, even rapidly discounted, Google simply doesn't sell nearly enough pixels to be profitable at it, like Apple, maybe Samsung or Huawei levels. And the desire to dog food things like notches last year and 90 hertz panels this year and test things early like Soli chips while trying not to lose too much money by including things like a third ultra wide camera turns the pixel into literally a device divided against itself. Something that can't really satisfy internal users because it also has to appeal to customers and can't truly prioritize customers because it's festooned with internal priorities. So the Pixel 4 ends up feeling like it's trapped between multiple quantum states, a phone with some jaw dropping technologies that has to service too many agendas and lacks the singular focus or vision to be what everyone really wants it to be, more than the sum of those technologies, to be truly great. So. Unlike most Nexus phones and nearly every Pixel phone past, like my friend and colleague, Daniel Bader of Android Central, I can't really recommend the Pixel 4. If you really want a Google phone this year, the Pixel 4 XL will at least mitigate the battery issues. Otherwise, OnePlus and Samsung have both had really good years and they might be worth checking out instead. I'll link up Android Central's buyer's guide below. That'll save you having to search for it. Unless, of course, you wanna build your own search engine with Brilliant. Have you ever wondered how Google can answer your question in just a fraction of a second, even though there are billions of websites for it to search through? In Brilliant's new search engine course, you get to explore the core ideas behind the algorithms and data structures that make exactly this kind of technology possible. Build your own simple search index and learn techniques for making search run faster on that index. And that's just one of the ways Brilliant elevates you to be your best thoughtful self. To support Vector and get unlimited access to Brilliant's courses and daily challenges, just head on over to brilliant.org slash vector and get 20% off their annual premium subscription. Thanks Brilliant and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. Well, there it is. That's my first non-iPhone phone review since maybe the Trio Pro or G1. So hit like if you wanna see more, share if you care, subscribe and pixel punch the bell gizmo so YouTube will actually tell you when more videos go live and then hit up the comments and let me know. What do you think of the Pixel 4 and what do you wanna see in the Pixel 5? Thank you for watching and see you next video.